Hello, this is Pastor Ken Larson, Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. And we're going to do a short Bible study, trying to make sense of this idea, uh, idea of being scattered versus together. And I want to begin the study by turning to the book of Acts, following Jesus' ascension into heaven on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, it is recorded that all the disciples were together in one place. Did you hear that? They were together in one place. Things went from very good to not so good. And by the time we get to the eighth chapter of Acts, Luke the historian records and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Except the apostles. They were all scattered, except the apostles. And verse 4, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Many, many years ago, I was a member of an organization had this for a slogan. We gather together to scatter, to gather the scattered together. And that's the mission of the church. We gather together in worship, usually on Sunday, on the first day of the week. We gather, and then we scatter. At the end of the worship service, we go to all corners of this earth, most of us within the same county, of course, and we scatter. And our one mission is to bring God's scattered people back together into the one church that he has established through his son, Jesus Christ. This is the usual Sunday morning adult Bible study. We usually meet in the upstairs conference room, but due to social distancing and due to my illness and due to the fact that many of our Bible class members are senior citizens, we're unable to gather there. But we do meet here, as God allows, through the digital and electronic means that he has provided to us. So that's what I'd like to do this morning to gathered together here in this room, this room which is a Zoom room. I've not been able to invite any of you to my Zoom conference, but I'd like to do that in the future if you'd like to join me. We'll talk about that another time. Together or alone? We would like to be together in many ways, together with family, together with members of our community, together with our co-workers, together in Bible class and worship, and all the other things we love to do together, together with families. What is happening on this Memorial Day weekend? It kind of, kind of saddens some of us that we're unable to be together. We are instead alone, and some, some in our community, I know you, you are alone because of divorce or death or disease. So we're going to contrast the idea of being together versus alone, connected versus disconnected. We're going to talk about the disconnected idea first. Have you been disconnected lately? Have you been disconnected from those you would like to be connected with? Of course you have. Back in 1969, the number five song for that year, record sales and uh, requests on the radio, was a song by the name of One. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Two can be as bad as one. It's the loneliest number since the number one. One hundred, two hundred, 
more than 200 songs are listed on one of the websites that I found about loneliness, not being with the one that you want to be with. And we're speaking romantically here, although it could be other kinds of loneliness. These songs were primarily about, I once was with that person and now we have been separated. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever hear. Is being alone okay? How common, how common is loneliness in America? Well, almost half in a survey done a couple of years ago when they interviewed 20,000 people, almost half said, I sometimes or almost always felt alone. Almost half said, I, I feel left out. There are reasons to be apart from one another because many of us have health concerns. We're more vulnerable to attack by this mysterious virus. And so we separate ourselves out of self-preservation. Not only the senior citizens are alone, but also young people, adolescents, and people of marriageable age in their 20s and 30s say, I feel alone, I feel left out. And not always because of health concerns. Are you okay with this idea of being alone? It's not necessarily bad or a negative experience. Many people value their time alone. There are times that I have walked alone around the block and thought of things higher than the sky. And there have been times I have walked alone around the block and had sad songs going through my head. But many people value their time alone so they can think about these things. People sometimes say they can get a get by just fine being alone when it's by choice. When I choose to be alone, in fact, I'm told that in the few weeks that we have experienced, the introverts have been really enjoying the idea of not being bothered by all us talkative people. Think about the times that you have enjoyed being alone. Can you imagine one of them? Do you know people who choose to be alone, or at least have some times that they choose to be alone? How about choosing to be alone or apart or disconnected from people? Take a moment to think about the times when you have enjoyed being alone, when you look forward to self-isolation. Did you choose it? When was it? And where was it? And what kind of an experience did you have? There are benefits to being alone. Jesus, often, we are told in the Gospels, sought to be alone. From Mark chapter 1, we read, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. He wanted to be alone. The previous day was filled with many healings, including the time that he healed Peter's mother-in-law. But now, after a few hours sleep, he got up before dawn while it was still dark. And there Jesus began praying. There was another time. John the Baptist was beheaded and then buried. It's recorded in Luke and um, Matthew chapter 14. When Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat desolate to a desolate place by himself. When he heard about the death of his good friend and cousin, 
John the Baptist. He needed to be alone. Why do people need to be alone? They need to be alone at times to rest from the cacophony of human voices that fill our world these days. They need to rest because of hard work or because of stress. They need time to be uh, decompressed, we sometimes say, to breathe easy. Maybe after a good night's sleep, to be alone, to rest. People need to be alone in order to pray. Some of you enjoy praying in church with other people. Some of you enjoy also being alone to talk to God, knowing that he hears you, but you like to be alone when you pray. One of the other benefits of being alone is to process a loss that has occurred in your family or amongst your friends. Someone has died or left the area. Uh, someone you're not likely to see again. And it's hard. The suffering of loss is a common human experience. And there are times we would like to think about that all by ourselves. Another benefit of being alone is to have a chance to meditate on passages or whole books of the Holy Scriptures. Many people like to be alone in order to plan. Blank sheet of paper, sharp pencil, one, two, three, four. Here is what I plan to do today. Here are my dreams, my ideas. Here's what I'd like to accomplish today or in this year or in my lifetime. Here are the things that I am contemplating, meditating upon. We need to be alone in order to pray. The value of being alone can be thought of as something that comes from God, and he knows that it's valuable to us. Speaking of the world in general, think how many inventors, scientists, explorers, creative people in the arts as well, needed time to be alone, disconnected from others, not bothered by their aloneness because they needed to be alone to create. We also, on the other hand, need to be needed, to be with others, connected with them, in joyful, hilarious, even tearful experiences. One time, there was a little boy happened upon a very old man who was sitting with his eyes closed, and he, he asked the old man, what is life's heaviest burden? And the old man opened his eyes and peered down at the little boy, and he said, having nothing to carry. We need to be needed. And burdens are not always burdensome. One, because God enables us to carry them. And second, because others can help us. So maybe it's a good idea to seek a balance, to have time for private thoughts and devotions and prayer and plan, uh, plans, and to have time for others, for serving and doing, acting, loving, caring. There is a time for everything, says the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. And there is a time to use alone time, time alone, constructively. I know the threat of the coronavirus has not passed. It is lessened, and some of you are getting back together, at least cautiously. For those of us who still have to be alone, I think for some time yet. There are four R's that I have imagined we can do. And the first 
is to realize that it is normal for us to feel isolated. And for that, we would pray for acceptance. Acceptance. The second R is to reach out. Part of acceptance is to realize that you've been given this time to reach out to someone else. There are other lonely people, and you know their email address, you know their phone number, you know how to text them, you can contact them in one of the many ways that are available. You can reach out to somebody else. You can reconnect by phone or text or email or social networking. You can take out a piece of paper and write a letter and fold it up and put it in an envelope and put a stamp on it and someone's address on it. <laughs> can you imagine the joy when someone gets a letter, a real letter written by hand from you with a first class stamp on the outside of the envelope? It means something to reconnect with people in any way that you can. And the fourth way that I suggest is that we reinvest. Reinvest, to be part of something beyond yourself, something valuable that is valuable to others. That is, you can give. That's time or money or things. You can be, that is, to be with someone if it is possible to be six feet apart and safe. You can love, and there are many uncountable, uncountable ways to love or to write or to show that you care. I wish we could hug. Feeling alone because of a disaster, now that's another thing entirely. We are suffering a kind of disaster, but let me take you to another one. As many of you know, the temple and all of the buildings in Jerusalem were destroyed. It is recorded in the books of the kings and the, and the, and the prophets. And then 70 years later, when the people of Israel came back from captivity in Babylon, one of them wrote a prayer, a song of lament, as he looked upon the total destruction of Jerusalem. If this person had been one that was there 70 years before and now came back as an old man, he was the writer of Psalm 102. 102, it is believed. And in verse 7, it is recorded in his prayer that became a psalm, he felt dismayed, alone, like a bird alone on a roof. Like a bird alone on a roof. Feeding alone now, are you, because of a disaster that has occurred? A, a virus disaster? Coming back from captivity in our homes captivity away from people, we may have experienced a different kind of separation, a degree of separation like none other we have ever experienced in our lives. And many of us don't deal with it very well. I'll tell you this, I'd rather be with people I get my energy from people. I don't get a whole lot of energy staring at, at, this, at this screen, at this camera. I can't see you. I can't enjoy your reactions and your camaraderie, your kindred spirits, your faith. I cannot hear you witness to how God is acting in your lives. So we've experienced a d degree of separation like any other. I suggest you read the 102nd Psalm when you get a chance. And take some time when you do that to praise the Lord for the safety he has so far enabled you to experience. You may start 
on the negative side, but this is a good way to pray. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to thee. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. The prophets and the apostles were often alone, partly because the message they had had, they had from the Lord had been rejected. That was Jeremiah's experience. That was Isaiah's experience. In Isaiah chapter 6, it is recorded he's not really alone. God is with him, and the six angels are hovering over the altar. Peter was praying alone on a roof like that bird in Psalm 102. He was praying alone on a roof when God gave him a vision. You're going to go visit a man named Sin, uh, a man, and you're going to tell him about Jesus. Paul goes alone into Arabia for a time. He doesn't tell us why. And the Apostle John has been exiled. That's a kind of aloneness I hope that you'll never experience. John is exiled to the island of Patmos, but it is for a godly purpose. It is on the isle of Patmos that the resurrected Jesus Christ gives John a revelation of what must soon happen. Together or alone, we're contrasting the idea of together versus alone, connected versus disconnected. I'd rather talk about being connected, wouldn't you? Many, many more times we read in the Bible that people were not disconnected. They were together. The apostles and the disciples of Jesus were together at Pentecost. They were together until the persecution scattered them. This is obviously part of God's design to put people together. In the beginning, when Adam was alone, God created a woman for Adam. Because, said God, it was not good for man to be alone. And throughout the history that is recorded in the Holy Scriptures, God is busy, busy, busy putting people together in families. They record their descendants. God gathers members of the church together today for worship. They gather together in order to scatter. They gather together in worship and prayer, especially in the book of Acts, just as people are gathering together today in the churches across America where it has been allowed. In the Old Testament, people were together in battles. You don't fight the battle alone. God told Gideon, I'll give you 300 men. That's all you'll need to fight with my strength. Joshua took up 30,000 men, and the Lord promised him he would be successful. I think you've heard it said there is strength in numbers. That's in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 4. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. The New Testament shows many, many gatherings of people for many, many purposes. Jesus is busy gathering his disciples. He teaches them together, and then he sends them out. Alone? One at a time? No. The Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. And do not greet anyone on the road. That was their mission, to go where he was about to go. 
Jesus, at the end of his 30 years on earth, celebrates the Passover not alone, but with others, as Luke reports in his gospel. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. The word communion is something I'd like to bring up, and it includes the idea of others being present. The CO of communion is the CO that means you're doing it with someone else or with many others being present. And we're talking here about the Lord's Supper, which is celebrated in congregations together. According to 1 Corinthians 10, the Supper, the Lord's Supper, is called communion. And we get that word especially from the King James translation. Paul writes a rhetorical question, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And of course, he is expecting a yes answer to both of those questions. The word communion in the New Testament comes from a Greek word, pronounced koinonia, koinonia. Most of you have heard about koinonia, koinonia groups, koinonia organizations, groups of believers gathered together for one or more purposes. The word koinonia in the New Testament means, depending on the context, communion or fellowship or sharing or participation, having things in common, partnership, can even mean offering. You are probably enjoying some kind of fellowship with others, but in the church, it is a koinonia. The entire church seeks koinonia. In the New, in the New Testament, the word is most commonly applied, according to the context, to communion or sharing or fellowship with other believers. The church is one. And that's something I want to emphasize in this study together. The church is one together. According to the New Testament, and indeed the witness of the entire Old Testament as well, there's only one collection of believers. It doesn't really have a name other than the word church. The word church coming from the Greek word ekklesia, which means the called out ones, called out of the world to witness to the world about the God who is in this world. That's the koinonia, the church, together. St. Paul writes in the most beautiful way, about the church in his letter to the Ephesians. Listen to the oneness, the oneness here. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called into the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. One church. The church is one together. As a matter of fact, Paul could write about the one church, even though there were many Christian congregations at the time, even though there were divisions in some of those congregations, and even between congregations. The church is one, and our response to this oneness, the oneness for which Jesus prayed, our response is to study the scriptures together. And in, in doing that, in studying the scriptures together, we draw from what God has inspired by his Holy Spirit. If you read Jesus' prayer in John 17, you will read about the oneness of the church. 
God wants us to learn from the scriptures and to understand what we have learned and to apply what we have understood, to apply that part of his will to our faith and to our life and to our teaching. And then thank God in every opportunity for the opportunities that he gives us to gather together to study. And then in that study, to encourage others to do the same. His will, God's will, is that we continue in the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread, that's the Lord's Supper, and the prayers. That's our study. I hope you've enjoyed the idea of gathering together through this media. And if you have any questions, I invite you to write to me, Pastor Ken Larson, at Trinity Lutheran Church. That's at 400 North Swinton Avenue in Delray Beach. Address at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. I would love to visit with you every week online by way of YouTube or if we can get together somehow in a Zoom room, we'll do that. But all you have to do to find the Bible study is to search YouTube for trinitydelray.org and click on the Sunday morning Bible study. At the same time, I want to invite you to worship with us in person at 8.30 and 10.30. If you can, come and do that safely according to your situation. We at the congregation are doing everything to, to keep things clean and to invite you to bring your mask and to come and worship with us in person. We'll take care of the social distancing for you and with you. Or if you can't come in person, use our broadcast, which occurs live at those times at trinitydelray.org slash live. Or if you can't be online at 8.30 and 10.30, you can watch it anytime on YouTube by searching for trinitydelray.org. Thank you for joining us in this Bible study about the oneness of the church and the eagerness of God, God's heart, and my heart as well, to gather us together. Lord Jesus Christ, be with us now and grant us your blessing. Also, may we be a blessing to others as we love them for you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Bye-bye now.